right here, a subject near and dear to my heart as someone who cares a lot about data science, analytics, and critical thinking, we are going to talk about data lakes and data rivers. Um, you may not know what a data lake is, but it's a term that data scientists use for a thing you just dump all your data into, kind of in the hope that you'll pull stuff out of it usefully later. It's not very real time. And so data scientists like to talk about data rivers that flow information in real time. Um, and this group was called by folks in government, uh, SEAL Team 6 for data. It's the New York City Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, or MODA, and they have a ton of stories of responding to crises, but no story like this year. Early in the pandemic, as you know, New York City was a hotspot for outbreaks, and uh, New York City joined the Emergency Response Center, the, the nerve center of the city, and used data to tackle an understanding of supplies, protective equipment, and so on. And remember, New York City is more populous than many countries. It's a pretty big place to be running. Um, they delivered daily insights and recommendations on everything from social distancing outreach. Uh, they launched the New York City Recovery Data Partnership, which is a nonprofit that works to aid in response and recovery efforts. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Kelly Jin, who is the Chief Analytics Officer and Director of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. Hi, Kelly. And Ryan Zerngabel, who is a data scientist in the New York City Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. Uh, I hope I got the name right, Ryan. Uh, thank you both for being here. Uh, I'm going to be tuned to what's going on, and I'll join you at the end if we have time. But uh, tell me more about Data Rivers. We will, and, and thanks so much, Alistair. It, it's really a, a privilege to be joining you all today. And I think really coming from what it still feels like is, is the nerve center these days here in New York City. And we're just really, really excited to talk more about all the lessons that we learned in the last uh, eight months, uh, ongoing eight months, and will continue to be uh, many, many more months uh, ahead. So uh, the title of the talk, as Alistair mentioned, Forget Data Lakes, um, the Need for Data Rivers in Government COVID-19 Response and Recovery. And I am very excited. Thank you guys again for hosting us uh, at Forward 50. And I'm so thrilled that we're talking with a global audience uh, not just folks here in New York City and in the United States, um, but a, a global audience around the world. So with that, um, just getting started here, uh, a little bit more about myself and uh, Ryan Zernkable, who I am joined by. So I am Kelly Jin. I serve as the city's chief analytics officer and director of the mayor's office of data analytics. We are a small but pretty nimble team of 10 data scientists, program managers, and policy advisors. Uh, and we have two big mandates here. One is we actually oversee and run the city's open data program and portal. We have over 2,000 free municipal data sets that you can take a look at. I highly encourage you to nyc.gov slash open data, one word. Uh, and of course, we also work on data analytics. No a team called the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics would be complete without its team of data scientists. Uh, and we work very closely with agencies on analytics projects, whether that's during blue skies or in our case today, we're gonna to tell you a little bit more about the emergency uh, response analytics projects that we have undertaken for New Yorkers. Um, and I will be joined by Ryan who will start speaking uh, in a couple of slides here. Ryan has been with uh, the city for now close to a decade in different capacities um, and really has worked at the forefront of not just municipal analytics, um, but emergency response analytics, uh, which has its very much its own uh, flavor there. Um, so I really wanted to start the presentation today um, with something that feels like a platitude, but also uh, accompanied by a photo of uh, New York City Hall here, uh, just to reminisce what it was like. Uh, we are all still remote. I'm working out of my living room here. Uh, and it is a, a statement here uh, that we need facts and data in order to be driven by facts and data. And I feel like whether you work in public sector or you work in private sector, this holds true. This holds true here uh, in the United States, in New York City, as we continue to monitor the COVID-19 situation. This holds true as we're trying to understand um, what is, is happening around the election and the results around the election is that we are constantly relying on a foundation of information and data and really rivers of that information flowing in from many, many different sources and being able to constantly uh, assess and make the right decisions uh, from those sources. 
before we get into the, the rest of the uh, presentation here, I also want to start with what is data analytics? Uh, maybe this is um, uh, not the right crowd to, to start with this on, but our work, when we get asked this question a lot, data encompasses a lot of different uh, sectors, different fields, different ways of approaching the work. And we roughly break out our data analytics work into four buckets. Uh, descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. And these are the questions that we are oftentimes will get a phone call or we will get an email. And uh, these questions on the right hand side that you'll see what is happening, why is it happening, what will happen in the future, what should be done are really the framework that drives our thinking because uh, we are oftentimes responsible for answering those questions. And what do we do? Uh, I'm not going to read all of the words on this slide. This is my blue sky slide that presents the different capacities we have as an analytics team, uh, the great work that our data scientists do, uh, other than to say during an emergency context, we really have done whatever is needed. Um, I wanna commend, of course, not just Ryan here uh, during this presentation, but our team of 10 has uh, for many, many months was working 24 seven to respond to whatever really has been needed and will continue to be needed here in the city um, to respond to the situation in New York. And I know for many of you who've been at the forefront, whether that's data or government or otherwise, um, this is a, a very, very important um, endeavor. Uh, and sometimes you just have to roll up your sleeves and, and get things done. And our presentation today, uh, we will start with, if you look on the left-hand side here, this is an actual uh, image, a photo of the New York City Emergency Operations Center uh, located actually just about a little bit less than a mile from where I live here in Brooklyn. Uh, and Ryan and I, early March, um, one day we got a call and uh, the next day we, we ended up at the Emergency Operations Center. Um, there are no windows in the center, although they do provide you with uh, unlimited coffee and, and food throughout the day that Ryan and I have a, a couple stories about that. Um, and while we were there, the work for us, really when you're hitting the ground, is broken out into a couple questions. What data do we have access to? Key questions that we have. Who's actually responsible for each of these indicators? And how should the data itself be presented? So Ryan's going to walk you guys through uh, two specific projects and examples of how we did that. Um, but I just want to emphasize how critical it was when you're walking in the door and you are, uh, we, we think a high powered data team that you are taking a step back and remembering that a lot of this infrastructure is really being built in that moment. Um, people are asking a lot of different questions. Um, we got a lot of questions like, does someone have an upstate database of insert the blank? Uh, in the city that we can also update hourly. My answer to every one of those questions was no, we do not because the city may not necessarily be tracking that uh, or that wasn't a use case or that wasn't a data point prior to the pandemic um, that we were really keen on, on centralizing and integrating that information. So for us, uh, you know, that little dotted line that you see uh, over all the way on the left-hand side, uh, this is just an image of the uh, curve of state hospitalizations here in New York State. Um, we were really at the beginning. Uh, that was mid, mid to late March for us there on the left-hand side. Uh, and so to be faced with those types of questions uh, for us, uh, we certainly get those questions again during Blue Skies. What I really want to get across to all of you, this is an image of the New York City organization chart with an arrow pointed where the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics lives. And for those of you who work in a broader bureaucracy in a very large organization, you know how complex it is to integrate data and to receive insights from that information, up-to-date insights, uh, even when we're not in the midst of a global pandemic. And so Ryan and I really walked in and took with us the past experience we've had of we really, really need to deliver value and we need to do it up front. We need to do it quickly. Uh, and we can't necessarily navigate every single one of these uh, tables that, that you see here uh, on, on the screen in front of you. And so bringing us back to the session title, um, you know, I, I wanted to present you all with an image. Maybe some of you haven't seen anything uh, close to this unless you've gone uh, out and, and uh, uh, had a nice vacation at, at a lake house. Um, but for us, as we think about data lakes, and I have, of course, nothing against the term itself, 
Um, but I do think about calm environments. I do think about what it's like when data is, is sitting and it's static and it may be updated daily, that that is uh, very much a different frame than the frame that we were in in March and April and even now today. Uh, it for us felt a lot more like we needed a lot of flowing information constantly to me, to Ryan, the policymakers and decision makers in the city. And that holds true that we're constantly out uh, trying to collect and better understand the situation here in New York for New Yorkers. And so I am not a kayaker. You would never find me uh, uh, here in that image at all. But uh, for me and Ryan, the, the last eight months or so was really navigating to, to assess the situation in somewhat choppy rivers and data rivers. Um, and we love a good metaphor here uh, within the mayor's office of data analytics. So I couldn't resist uh, continuing on this uh, thread and theme with all of you. So with that, I'm gonna tee up Ryan here. He's going to talk about two particular projects, uh, one early on that we worked on at the Emergency Operations Center uh, on face coverings and our work with masks and uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. Um, and then we'll talk about a lot of our work over the summertime. Uh, and I was really focused around social distancing here in New York City. We are a, a population of 8.6 million New Yorkers. Um, and uh, every year, 1.1 million kids go through the, the school system here. So it's, it's quite a, a large uh, number of people in a very dense urban environment. So with that, Ryan, I will turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, I think I'd just like to get started today kind of by bringing everyone back to the early days um, of, of, of the end of March and the beginning of April and something that kind of was going on during that time with this pandemic um, worldwide and was not very different um, here in New York is that there was a focus on personal protective equipment. Um, due to a supply shock in these early days and weeks, this very quickly became the operational priority for us here in New York. Um, folks, that meant folks were asking questions in the emergency operations center, like how many masks do agencies and hospitals have on hand? How large is the emergency stockpile of PPE that we have? Or even more specific questions like how many N95 respirators did the fire department use yesterday? Um, you know, and with these questions come challenges. Um, one main challenge uh, was one that Kelly mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, there's no central database to track the inventory of masks or PPE across the city at this time. Um, it didn't create or provide insight on how these masks are being used or who is using the most masks. Um, and then generally just Kelly and I have a limited understanding of PPE. Um, we're not experts in that area in general. Things we learned during that time, there are so many different types of PPE, some, some of which are displayed here on your screen. We've got surgical gowns, gloves, masks, ear loop masks, surgical, non-surgical. Some of them are expired, some of them are not expired. Um, just a lot to learn there. Uh, I, remember, I specifically remember kind of running back and forth in the EOC and looking at pictures that somebody had taped onto the wall of like, this is what an N95 mask looks like. Um, so it was kind of a nice little moment that helped remind me that we are all in this together and we're kind of learning as we go as well. Um, but, you know, I, I, I want to hammer home that I think as technologists and innovators, um, we're often pushing the envelope on what's possible. We might be persuading decision makers to see the world in a little bit of a different light or even just acting as advocates from within our own organizations. Um, and I think that sometimes that can feel a little bit like this next slide here. Um, and it feels like swimming upstream, you know, uh, as many of you may probably already know, you know, each year salmon swim upstream to spawn during their mating season. Um, they're fighting the current that's going downhill. They're traversing or avoiding altogether obstacles along the way, uh, obstacles like maybe some hungry grizzly bears. Um, and I think they can easily get isolated in rapids like these and lose their school, if you will. Um, I think joining a team during an emergency response can be very similar. Um, the water is already flowing, if you will. So there's teams that are focused on fielding requests, filling in orders. And we wanted to prioritize not getting in the way of that or creating additional barriers for these teams that were you know, on the phone and understanding who needs masks. Let's get them those masks as quickly as possible. Um, 
you know, I think there was a lot of running around already happening and communication channels that were already being used. Uh, for example, there was an, already an executive dashboard that had a layout that was being distributed daily um, that, that we were going to end up being asked to, to help with. So I think what should we do in a situation like this? Um, well, don't be like the salmon right away. I think, you know, the, the, the tip here is to just go with the flow. Stay with your school before turning upstream. Um, and trying to navigate these these obstacles. So what does that mean? Um, observe the flow of information, learn the process. What are different teams around the room working on? Uh, where can I step in? How can I help? Think about carving out a small piece of this process for yourself um, in order to begin creating value. Uh, I think one, you know, to get into one example of how Kelly and I repudiated the idea of being a Sam in the spring um, is here on the next slide. Um, it's just one small piece of, of, of the executive leadership dashboard I mentioned. Um, it was a table that was living in a PowerPoint file. It was being updated daily with information that was coming from a bevy of different sources. Um, and the, initial, the individual that was initially accountable for this table was being pulled away into a separate priority. Um, now, updating numbers within a PowerPoint table is not a, an ideal scenario uh, as a data scientist. I'm thinking of Kelly's slide that that very loudly said we do whatever is needed here. Um, but, you know, swimming upstream, if you will, in the moment and dictating or asserting major changes to a current process can be dangerous too. Uh, remember, there's hungry grizzly bears upstream here, folks. Um, so all of this is to say that sometimes there's simply no shortcut for this sort of manual work. And that may mean working in PowerPoint. Uh, sorry, R and, Py and Python users. Of <laughs> I'm also a user there. Um, but it can mean sourcing numbers from emails or phone calls or maybe even physically walking over to a desk to ask somebody about the number for today. Um, and I think through updating a table like this, we started to see a little bit of a shift happen um, where on day one, I think there were some questions around, you're like, who, who owns the PPE table? Um, where are these numbers coming from? And then kind of just progressing in day two and day three hearing, oh, you know, it's Moda that's handling the PPE table. Um, that's Ryan and Kelly. They sit right over there. Uh, and then even on day four and five of this activation, it had progressed to, oh, hi, Ryan and Kelly. Uh, I have a question about the table. Um, so what you can kind of see here is that we're gaining a little bit of trust and credibility with the larger group uh, as we simply just work to update these numbers daily and be part of the team. Um, now, we were getting some questions and feedback, like I said, if somebody came up and said, hey, we have a question about the table. Um, it's a great tool. Uh, we began to actually use those questions and feedback as a bit of a guiding light for us, um, and it helped us set a course forward. For example, some questions that may have been asked of us, you know, John from Logistics just procured a huge number of N95 masks, quite miraculously at this point. Um, is, is that order, uh, is that procurement order actually being reflected in this table currently? Or another one could be, we know that agencies and hospitals have their own supplies uh, and we have an emergency stockpile. Uh, have we actually started using the emergency stockpile yet? Um, so I think at this point, receiving these kinds of questions and feedback from folks, having gone with the flow for a little bit in early days, um, we're thinking about turning upstream and, and, and we feel armed with these questions and feedback. Um, and on my next slide here, what, what that kind of looked like was it meant adding to the table that we were already tasked with updating. Initially, with a very simple chart that looks something like this, uh, we've got a time on the x fat on the x-axis, and and uh, for example, here maybe a number of masks that we have in the stockpile on the y-axis. And you know, our our job as data professionals is to make obvious facts which may not be clear at a first glance. Um, and while that previous table was great for maybe press briefings or delivering daily the number of here's how many masks we have or here's how many masks we used yesterday. Um, it still required our end users to do a little bit of math or make some assumptions to understand a core fact that we're trying to explain here. Um, and what's important to remember is that in an emergency scenario like this, our end users are commissioners, our deputy mayors, or maybe the mayor himself. So these are individuals that don't have a lot of time and don't have a lot of mind space to really dedicate to those sorts of assumptions or, or maybe math in their head, if you will. So we want to remove those obstacles. Uh, for us, that meant displaying one, going from displaying one data point at a point in time in the table to a simple time series that displayed multiple points over time um, and had multiple days of information. This had a two-prong effect. Uh, first, it answered the questions that people are initially coming to us with. You can see here, yes, that the order that John from Logistics procured is actually 
it's updated in, in our uh, dashboard that that's the large spike that you see in the black line there or that yes we actually have begun to distribute from our emergency stockpile and that's why you kind of see your black line creeping down a little bit as time moves forward um another outcome that we had of this which was a great one at the time is people continue to ask you more questions ask us more questions um so on my next slide it's kind of a visualization of folks coming up and asking us questions like if we continue at this rate when are we going to hit zero masks or we're currently providing masks to city agencies like the police department or the fire department what if we also start begin to distribute masks to New York City public hospitals or all hospitals in the city, which was something we had begun to doing? Um, you know, these questions required new data. That new data meant more daily phone calls. It meant digging through more emails. It meant more desk site check-ins. Um, it eventually meant going through a large state hospital survey with hundreds of questions to try to get a handle on the number of masks that hospitals were using, the number of masks that they had on hand. Um, now, but this was additional work, but uh, we had really shifted from a world of, we have X masks, we used Y masks yesterday, uh, into a new world where now we had decision makers and leaders saying things like, well, if we distribute our masks to these agencies or these hospitals or these agencies and these hospitals, we're going to need more masks before June, before July, before October. Um, so let's work on sourcing additional masks. We have X amount of weeks to get there. Um, this may seem like a small change, but we've effectively moved from just, just giving descriptive statistics about this emergency stockpile of PPE that we have to using predictive analytics. That's actually, and that change was actually driven by our end users and the questions they were having. Um, we got there in less than a week, and more importantly, we avoided all those hungry grizzly bears that I that I mentioned earlier. Um, so I, I think you know, moving a little bit forward in time, like Kelly mentioned, we would into the summer. Um, New Yorkers were beginning to head outside a little bit more, experience nicer weather, um, you know, and 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 along with that, I think there was an added focus on compliance with uh, social distancing. So. Kind of keeping apart from one another. Um, this is actually a, a picture at the top of my slide here of New York City Parks Commissioner on the left side, uh, Mitchell Silver. He's demonstrating some new signage that showed up in New York City Parks over the summer um, that basically showed New Yorkers what a proper six feet was um, from each other. And then just under that, I've, I've included a screen capture of, of the New York City 301 website, um, which is a resource for many of quality of life, information sharing, or sometimes enforcement tasks here in the city of New York. Um, it's a place where New York City residents can call or use an app on their phone to do all sorts of things, like maybe requ request a bulk trash pickup if you have a mattress or a couch that needs to go out, um, or even request information uh, or appointments about programs that the city offers. Like if you're interested in getting a New York City ID card, for example, you can call through and want to schedule a, uh, an appointment to do that. Um, so with summer on the horizon and a potential flood of New Yorkers looking to get outside, um, a new complaint type was added to this 301 system specifically for New Yorkers to call and report um, instances where there's a lack of social distancing going on. Um, so what you'll see on the next slide here is, is actually um, a chart that shows the daily count of those social distancing type complaints um, that were made from the end of March right through to the to the end of June. Um, you know, if anybody who's who's watching along here has any guesses for what those spikes may be there in the middle and in, in late April and early May, feel free to throw them into the chat. Um, I'd love to see what people think is happening there. Um, but essentially, what, what we already knew here is we knew the key measure. Uh, people were interested in social distancing complaints. We knew who was reporting them. Thank you to the New York City 301 team. Um, in order to access this data, we did have a couple of go-to resources in mind. Um, New York City Open Data is a wonderful one, like Kelly mentioned earlier. Uh, we also have an internal data warehouse, um, both of which house this sort of 301 data. Um, now, we had previous knowledge of these data sources. We knew things like there was a reporting lag with each one, um, ranged from a day to a day and a half after after these calls and requests were made that we had the information. Um, we knew that open data boasts a good amount of fields for each complaint that's made, um, but also that there's a larger list of information that we have access to internally, um, largely to protect the privacy of our complainants. Um, 
And we knew important information like this because we have experience with these data sources. We've used them in our bluer sky, greener pasture projects that you heard Kelly mention. Um, and having this experience is really invaluable during emergency situations. Um, alongside seemingly simple tools like making sure you have valid up-to-date credentials or accessible documentation or an accessible point of contact who can be the expert on this data set in case you have very specific questions. Um, but it, having all of this allows us to move at the required pace during an emergency response, um, which, was you, which you would imagine is everything happening much faster. Um, so, you know, we had all of these tools, but something we didn't have at the time um, was a baseline. We didn't have a baseline for how many social distance complaints is a lot. You know, we we're looking at a great chart here that boasts some data, but this isn't something we had access to in the, in the late days of March. Um, we didn't know how, what, a, what a day with a lot of complaints was. Um, so, you know, basically, um, what did we do? You know, moving on to the next slide here to answer the little bit of a guess I had, um, I put out earlier was, you know, the first spike was actually the result of a call to action from our mayor um, asking New Yorkers to say, hey, if you see lack of social distancing going on, pick up the phone, let us know, we want to help. Um, and then the three other spikes were actually just really, really nice weather days in the, in the early spring, I think, after New Yorkers were kind of tired of being cooped up all winter long. Um, so sorry, Mr. Mayor, but your call to action wasn't quite as effective as a beautiful spring day. Um, but without this baseline, you know, really going in, getting into what we did on my next slide here is we started simple. And this is Excel spreadsheet simple, folks. We started to identify locations that had multiple complaints each day. We summarized a few important pieces of information about these locations. How many complaints did we see? What's the location? I've kind of blocked out the addresses here just to help protect the privacy of these locations a little bit. But you know, which administrative districts are they located in? Was it previously uh, a hot spot before? H has it come up on our list? Um, is, do the complaints have to do with a business type that should actually be closed right now due to the shutdown? Um, and we surf it, and we use this information to really help drive uh, early enforcement of social distancing or help to understand where potential problem areas can be across the city. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of this work was really only possible through qualitative, looking at the data, understanding it and doing it. So again, no shortcut for manual work there, uh, but still providing value nonetheless. Um, and eventually we're able to expand on these early ideas. So on this slide, what you'll see is a couple of visualizations that we ended up using to help visualize the information in ways that folks were asking about. Um, you know, here are two, these are just two examples, but as the data and questions grew, we started to pivot to, to answer some of them. Um, you know, people had questions about top hotspots in seasons, uh, you know, weekends versus weekdays, or the spring versus the summer, are the hotspots changing kind of as, as time goes on? Um, you know, and we were using different tools for different scenarios enabled by this data. You know, where or when should we enforce for a rowdy restaurant or bar corridor? Um, or versus, you know, where and when should we enforce for a, a crowded park um, where folks are just getting outside? Uh, I think, you know, in, in closing here, we're really just able to lean on our past experience with this three on one data um, from those non-emergency situations in order to quickly understand what was possible, what was not in terms of these questions we were getting um, as they walked in the door. And it really allowed us to approach this kind of enforcement with more of a scalpel than a sledgehammer. Um, so kind of just to really quickly recap, um, these are just five points I think that summarize a few of the things that we learned in the springtime during this emergency response. Um, and I think you, I would like to t have you take this away as almost your proverbial uh, helmet, paddle, and kayak for when you're traversing a river of your own. Um, but with that, you know, I, I think we've talked a little bit about emergency data response. Um, and I'd like to toss it back to Kelly now to talk a little bit about uh, data recovery and, and the recovery data partnership, which is something that our team has helped put together um, to help think about recovery. Thanks so much, Ryan. And, and I will say for everyone watching, um, I, I was uh, getting a lot of joy seeing some of the uh, uh, ideas for the spikes come through. I think uh, department restock toilet paper might have been my uh, favorite one coming in the, the door here. Um, so, you know, we were I was seeing some questions here around uh, we stood up a lot of this infrastructure early on very quickly. What's next? You know, we're, we're eight months uh, in. 
at this point. Um, we were very, very fortunate that um, we had a window and opportunity. We actually heard a lot of demand from city agencies that they would really like to see more external data ingested into the city in order to complete analysis. Um, and we also are very fortunate here in New York City that we had a lot of external uh, organizations, nonprofits, large companies say, how can we help? And a lot of them had New Yorkers, of course, um, uh, working on their various teams. And so uh, in, in June, uh, June and July, late July, we launched the New York City Recovery Data Partnership, um, really focused around how can we help support our, our agencies uh, with their decision making, with their policy making, um, you just, you guys should definitely know that we're technology nerds here. These are some of our initial uh, infrastructure data diagrams that we sketched out at the very outset. So we built up an entire governance structure. Um, this information is, is all available online at nyc.gov slash recovery data, one word. Um, and we have a lot of the artifacts that we've stood up and it was really important to us that we were intentional about the governance structure here and the approval processes. So city agencies now come to us uh, and apply for different use cases that they have about how they're gonna use external data sets. And we're able to take uh, at this point, uh, very lucky to say um, 13 different data partners and providers data and make that available at no cost to city agencies, as long as it's under the COVID-19 uh, umbrella of different use cases. So uh, we were very, very fortunate. Um, you see everyone from Street Easy, uh, which is Zillow Group's uh, New York City brand to LinkedIn, um, to a lot of these providers providing us with aggregated rolled up New York City data um, that is being put into the hands of agency analysts to complete their uh, analysis day to day and week to week. Um, and of course, I'm going to show you all uh, uh, after because Ryan was showing you all the early uh, dashboards that were built out. The infrastructure that we now have um, is really incredible. So we've stood up forms to receive applications from agencies. Uh, we've actually integrated our data sharing using uh, Microsoft SharePoint, um, which a lot of the agencies are uh, use uh, through their day to day. Um, and of course, I wanted to show how are we actually uh, updating our dashboard. So you'll see actual uses uh, uh, there in the lower right hand corner around Street Easy, some real estate data uh, coming in from the data providers. Uh, so it is, I, I know I glossed over a lot of hard work in between, but know that even when it's early days um, and you are building a dashboard uh, in, in PowerPoint, um, uh, and I'm sorry, Ryan, but like entering uh, numbers manually, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And it's so critically important that we continue to think about what are all these information flows and data rivers into the city that are being constantly updated. So the data sets you see here as a part of the recovery data partnership, um, we are thinking about weekly, daily updates around that information, just given the ongoing situation around response and recovery. Um, and of course, I, I don't wanna say like New York City is, is doing it all and we have all of the information. I wanna point you all to a couple other resources as well. Um, there's several organizations, Opportunity Insights there in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, one of the best examples, Raj Chetty's group at Harvard. They're making economic sector data here in the United States available. So they themselves have also partnered with a lot of organizations and they're pushing all of that information public, which I think is incredible. And then lower right-hand corner, open table, a lot of different large, large companies um, are providing their data and rolling it up so that folks understand the impact to different uh, industries and, and different sectors. Um, and so I uh, definitely, uh, uh, you know, so much to discuss and, and talk about with all of you. I encourage you all to take uh, a bit more of a look at our website, nyc.gov slash analytics. These resources will be uh, online. You guys can reach both Ryan and me at our Twitter handles there. You'll, you'll see on the screens. Um, and maybe in our last uh, minute here, I see Ryan, there's, everyone always wants to know like what is a Moda data scientist tech stack and, uh, and what actually do you use because perish the thought, you know, we don't, we're not an Excel shop by any means. Um, so maybe as a last question here, Ryan, if you could speak to that before we turn things back over to Alistair. 
Sure, absolutely. Um, I think that at Moda, we're, we're a little bit of an odd beast where I think a lot of places kind of have a unified tech stack. Um, we started something that we, we bring, basically bring your own tool. Um, so our four data scientists usually basically use um, R and Python. I myself am an R user. Um, there are three data scientists who primarily work in Python. Um, you know, I, I think it's just something we've kind of developed to a workflow to kind of make those tools work seamlessly together by using open format file types, that sort of thing. We're just generally really big fans of open source technology uh, and open data. So I think, you know, when, I, when I'm tagged with a project or a task, my first thought is, okay, what open and available information do I have at my fingertips? Which tools can I use that are widely adapted? And there's a large audience talking about using them as well. Um, and of course, we can save money for our taxpayers by not needing uh, maybe an expensive license or something there. I think another, a, a few more tools that, you know, one that we certainly displayed here pictures of was um, Cardo, which is a wonderful geospatial tool for quickly putting together maps that you may have to send off to another group. You know, like I said, I work in R. I, I usually like to make my own maps with tools in that open source program. But um, when time is of the essence and I have to send a map to somebody and I can do that with a link and a password, um, Cardo is definitely a useful tool there. Um, yeah. Terrific. Thanks, Ryan. And, and I hope um, you all, please, we are um, always excited to engage with and learn from other uh, jurisdictions and, and certainly learn from other countries as well. So I'm um, really, really excited to hear people's feedback and reactions and uh, definitely want to hear folks' stories on what they've been up to over the last eight months. Um, and I will say, as a data scientist and data nerd and big fan of the Big Apple, I usually am in the Javits Center for Strata, uh, which was another casualty of this of this uh, pandemic, uh, and I know you had to turn that into a hospital in rapid time. Uh, I am sure that hundreds, if not thousands, of people owe you their lives, um, and people probably don't say that often enough. This all seems very theoretical when we're talking about data pipelines and toilet paper, but there are families that aren't crying about missing a loved one because of the work you've done. So um, this is great to hear, but also kind of sobering. Keep up the good work. Um, I also got to say. I've always watched the Silicon Alley, Silicon Valley kind of rivalry happening. Uh, you see a lot of big tech firms that have done amazing things in the Valley, but uh, boy, when New Yorkers roll up their sleeves, they can push hard on some tech pretty damn well. So uh, thank you all so much for the work you've done. Uh, I've always been fans of yours as a data science nerd myself, and uh, it must be very fulfilling to see that the work you're doing makes real changes in people's lives you know, right now. So thank you all for being here, for sharing that. Um, Last thing, if people want to find out more about this, you provided some links. I know there's some stuff in the chat. You got lots of questions there. Uh, go join in on the chat on the platform. And then we've put both of your Twitter handles here. So if there's anything else, just tweet it to the Ford 50 hashtag. Uh, maybe next year we'll get to do this in person. And I'm honored to be the platform that can get this message out, not just to other countries, but to communities all over the world. I don't know if you heard the numbers, but it's like 79 regions, 29 countries, thousands of people uh, all tuning into this stuff and all of whom will have access to the data and the recordings over the coming year. So thank you all so much for getting into the details. Uh, Ryan and Kelly, you are absolute heroes and we loved having you here. Thanks, Alistair. I appreciate thank it, you. everybody. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye. Bye.